there we are. Uh, this is what we're doing today. This week, we're analyzing rational functions. We did equations yesterday, and today we're going to be looking at the graphs. And as you'll see, doggone it, we're going to have to factor. All right, there are two things that I'm going to be doing here. I'm going to be um, uh, finding the domain and I'm going to be talking about the vertical asymptote. Rational functions almost always have a break in their graph. And when there's a break, most of the time, not all the time, you're going to have a vertical asymptote. So that's what we're talking about today. All right, first we have to find the domain. And to find the domain, the numerator doesn't even come into it. We don't care what's up there when we're finding the domain. So let's see, 64 x squared minus 16 x plus one. Now there is no, I, I have to factor this. I have to set it equal to zero in order to find the x's that will make the denominator equal zero because they have to be thrown out. So I'm going to, uh, since 64 is not one, I'm going to have to use the AC method to find the two middle terms that we're going to have to factor by uh, GCF. I mean, um, not GCF we're going to have to factor by grouping, or we could use the quadratic formula. I didn't even think about that. Let's see. That might be the best way. What I just did is I looked at this, and I'm not at all sure that we'll be able to find uh, an x-intercept. So let's use the quadratic formula. That might end up being easier and quicker. A equals 64, B equals negative 16, and C equals one. And of course, our friend, X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over all over 2A. All right, now we're going to need the calculator, I'm pretty sure. So we'll stick it over there. So negative negative, negative 16 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 squared minus four times 64, ugh, times one, suppose I shouldn't have a negative attitude, should I? Over two times 64. This may have been an error, but let's go on and see what happens. Negative negative 16 is going to be positive 16 plus or minus. Now, whatever is under the radical is going to be two times 64, which is one 28. Now let's see what this monster looking thing is going to be. Okay. There. Um, 
parentheses, negative 16, parentheses closed, squared, minus 4 times 64, and I'll even say times 1, even though that is a little silly. Let's see what we've got. Zero? You're kidding me. Okay, that's great. Zero. So, what is plus or minus zero? It's just zero. The square root of zero is zero. So this term is completely gone, and all we're left with is 16 over 128. I thought it was going to be horrible. So 16 divided by 128. Math, frac, enter. One eighth. One eighth is the number that is going to have to be taken out of the domain. That's the bad boy right there. It also means that the vertical asymptote, this red line, red dashed line that goes down through the break is going to be located at X equals one eighth. It acts as a wall to prevent either arm of this graph going through it, going through where X equals one eighth, which would result in us having an explosion if this were real life and we were working at a power plant. All right, so we're going to write the domain in two separate, um, by two separate methods, interval notation and set builder notation. Interval notation is based on the x-axis. Okay. So we have positive infinity, negative infinity, and here I've decided is one eighth. I'm going to say that one eighth is right here, and I'm going to make a break in the x axis. That's one eighth. Okay, now all of the numbers here are okay, and all of the numbers here are okay, just not one eighth. We're on the x-axis here. So, these are okay. These are okay. Which means the interval notation for my domain is going to look just like that, only a little bit neater. We're going to go from negative infinity to the left side of one-eighth unioned up with, you put a U in the break, the right side of one eighth, going all the way to positive infinity. Here's a kind of picture of it, and here is how we write it. Now set builder notation, X such that X is real. And X cannot be allowed to equal one eighth. So there you go, we found the domain by looking at the um, denominator. We don't care what's in the numerator when we're finding the domain. 
this is the number that has to be taken out of the domain. Okay, and I used the quadratic formula and had no idea that that was going to equal zero. I suppose if I had looked at it, yeah, yeah, but there you go. Questions about this? And here's your vertical asymptote going through the number that's not allowed to be in the graph. That's why there's a break in the graph, because that number cannot be used. So, so how do you show that in my math lab? Um, all they ask you to do on this particular well, all right, on all of them. Sometimes they ask you interval notation. Sometimes they ask you set builder notation. And when you're asked to find the vertical asymptote, you have to give the equation of the vertical asymptote. And this is the equation of the vertical asymptote. OK. OK. Good, more questions. Let me put a box around this and a box around there. I'll try to make it a little neater next time. Here we have another one. Look at this, seven over a cubic. And look at this, look at the number of breaks you have in the graph. You have one, two, three breaks. Okay, here's what that means. If we're writing the domain, let's see, I think I'll write it in black because it's really easier to see. If we're writing the domain in set builder notation, this is what it's going to look like. X such that X is a real number. I just say X is real to cut down on the words. And X cannot equal, and you'll have one number and a comma, another number and a comma and another number and a comma and then brackets and you can see that there are indeed three breaks now they might actually be those numbers but they might not so we have to find out in interval notation when you have three breaks whatever they are so i'm going to draw them I'm going to draw a break and a break and a break. They don't have to be evenly spaced. Then you're going to have parentheses here. Parentheses here. Parentheses here. And parentheses here going all the way to positive infinity. Okay, and here's the x-axis. Okay, and so your breaks are going to be here and here and here. 
We just have to find out what they are. OK, so again, I'm not interested in that seven at all. What I am interested in is 2x to the third minus 20x squared plus 32x equals zero. And I can look at this and see that a two goes into all three of those numbers, so I'm going to have a GCF. <gasps> Not only that, but there are X's in each term. So, all right, let's just break it down. This is two times X times X times X minus 10 times two times x times x plus 16 times 2 times x equals 0. And I can see looking at each of these terms that each term contains a 2x. So I'm going to circle it that will be my GCF. So I'll write the GCF and mark through it. Parentheses, write the leftovers, x squared minus 10x plus 16 equals zero. Okay, I'm going to now make an assumption and you know how dangerous that is. I'm going to make an assumption that what's in the parentheses can be factored. So let's see, let's factor positive 16. 16 equals 1 times 16, 2 times 8, and 4 times 4, and negative 1 times negative 16, negative 2 times negative 8, and negative 4 times negative four. And we need to find two numbers that add up to negative 10. And notice there's a one now in front of the X squared. So our factoring, if it's factorable, will take this form. And I think it will be because negative two plus negative 8 equals negative 10. So that tells me what number to put here and here. Minus 2 and minus 8. So the whole thing is factorable. The denominator, that's all we're working with. And so now I have three factors. I have 2x. I have x minus 2. Let's bring it down. We're going to need three lines. Right? And then x minus 8. And I set each factor equal to 0. 2x equals 0. x minus 2 equals 0. And x minus 8 equals 0. Over here on the first factor, I divide both sides by 2. 
So X equals zero over two, which is zero. Now, over here, I add two to both sides of the equation. X equals two. And over here, I add eight to both sides of the equation, which gives me X equals eight. So these are the three numbers that will cause the denominator to equal zero. The three values of X that will cause an explosion. So I have to make sure I say X cannot equal zero, X cannot equal two, and X cannot equal eight. And now I know exactly the numbers to use up here. Zero. So from negative infinity to zero, I can use all the numbers on the x-axis. That is not zero, but up to the left side of zero. Not zero. Um, start on the right side of zero and go all the way to, but let's write these, this will make it easier. Zero, two, and eight. Okay, now from the right side of zero to the left side of two, from the right side of two to the left side of eight, and from the right side of eight, all the way to infinity. And over here, zero, two, and eight. Now let's look at the vertical asymptotes. We know what they are now. The equations of vertical lines always start with X equals, X equals, and X equals. So now I know what these numbers are. X equals zero. X equals zero is the Y axis. X equals two. and x equals eight. That's where the breaks are. So that's where the vertical lines go as a kind of a safety mechanism. Let me erase that. Okay, now vertical asymptotes are not the only kind of ap asymptotes, but they're what we're talking about today. If you go on to calculus, you'll discover many, well, yeah, you'll discover a lot of different asymptotes. They show tendencies or breaks. The vertical ones show breaks. All right, any discussion about this? See that we take the same steps. Let me write X here. Over and over again with these, whenever you're looking for the domain, just the domain, when that's the only question. It's the denominator you care about. Most of the time, 
the denominator will give you all of your vertical asymptotes. And in this class, I tried to keep it that way. And when you go to calculus, you'll discover some other things. So hopefully I didn't fail at that. Try to keep it simple in the beginning. Well, this is similar to that. But notice, they're nice enough to already factor this for us. And now what they're asking for is the vertical asymptotes. What they don't tell you is that you have to find the domain first. So let's do it. Since they've already factored this for you, life is going to be much easier. X plus two times X minus five equals zero. We set each factor equal to zero. X plus two equals zero. X minus five equals zero. Subtract two, subtract two. X equals negative two. Now over here, add five to both sides, plus five. That will give us X equals five. So this line is X equals negative two. And this line is X equals Five. But in doing this, we also found the domain. Because X will not be allowed to equal negative two. And X will not be allowed to equal positive five. So we might as well get a little practice and find the domain. Is somebody going to say something? Uh, yes, um, so it's basically just the domain with, with, with the equal sign. Yes, yes, it's, it's what's not allowed in the domain. Oh, okay. Okay, so now if I were going to write the domain, For interval notation, you always want to think about the x-axis. And the fact that there are breaks in the x-axis. That match those two numbers. So this is negative two. And this is positive five. So interval notation. Will be that unioned up with this, unioned up with this. You've got negative infinity down here and positive infinity up here. So you've got negative infinity to the left side of negative two. All of those numbers can be used from the right side of negative two all the way to the left side of five, all these numbers can be used. And from the right side of five, all the way to infinity. And then set builder notation, all X such that X is real. And X cannot equal negative two and positive five. So 
So the vertical asymptotes <clears throat> and the domain of a rational function are very closely related. And you can also see that these get a little bit easier as you go along and you get a feeling for what's going on. OK, factor the bottom, set it equal to zero, set each factor equal to zero, solve each little equation. You've got the numbers that have to be taken out of the domain and those numbers become the vertical asymptotes and the equations of the vertical number of uh, the equations of the numbers that are the castaways are these x equals negative two is the equation of the vertical asymptote here and x equals five is the equation of the vertical asymptote here Okay. All right. And here we go. Now, for these, you could probably do that in your head, but why do it? We've got, no, I want to write in black. There, okay. X minus four squared equals zero. So take the square root of both sides. It's almost like the square root method, except since zero isn't positive or negative, you don't have to use plus or minus, which is nice. So the square root of x minus 4 squared is x minus 4. And the square root of 0 is 0. Add 4 to both sides. And like I said, you could have done this in your head by asking yourself, what would make that be 0? Well, if you had 4 minus 4, that would be 0. So what you're going to get is x equals Four. Now this is the equation of this vertical asymptote right there. X equals four. And for the domain, well, let's do this, all X such that X is real. and x cannot equal 4. Very important. And up here, since 4 is our castaway number, we're going to use all the numbers on the left of 4 and all the numbers on the right of 4, and a u goes where four is. Negative infinity to the left side of four, the right side of four to positive infinity. Let's get the whole picture in view there. Discussion about this. Question about this. Okay. Now, oh, here we have something interesting. 
we actually have an X in the in the numerator. That doesn't change anything. The fact is, this is what gives me my domain. So that is what I care about. For these particular questions, three minus X equals zero. It's easier. The lazy person's way of doing this is just to add, add X to both sides. So sure, why not? Add X, add X, negative X plus X is zero, and I'm left with a three equals zero plus X, which is X. That's the equation of the vertical asymptote. Okay, now of course, that means, especially when you're writing interval uh, uh, set builder notation, you know how mathematicians say X is a real number? There. Shows how lazy we are. There. So X cannot be allowed to equal three. And there's actually a hole, just so you know, there's actually a hole in the X axis there because three had to be taken out through no fault of its own. Interval notation, negative infinity to the disallowed number, unioned up with the other side of that number going all the way to infinity. When all you've got is one X asymptote, that makes life pretty, a uh, vertical asymptote, I'm sorry. That makes life really easy. So see, as hard as this seems, it's really not. And good grief, we have more than a half an hour left. I cannot let you go. So we're going to start talking about asymptotes. And I think that's a good thing so that when we start tomorrow, I can just do a quick review for everyone who wasn't here. And then we can jump into the excitement. Vertical asymptotes are one kind of asymptote. There are also, and you'll see this word sometime, we're not going to do it in this class, oblique asymptotes. And they can be subdivided into other kinds of asymptotes. Like for instance, slant asymptotes are oblique asymptotes that are slanted. That's just one kind of oblique asymptote. Like I said, if you go to calculus, you, well, depending on what kind of calculus you take, you might or might not talk about oblique asymptotes. They would probably be important though for business because they show tendencies over time. That's why they're so important. Um, and then there are horizontal asymptotes, which we are definitely going to be talking about tomorrow. Horizontal asymptotes.
You'll definitely talk about those also in calculus. And I'll tell you what, learning about horizontal asymptotes is in calculus is actually easier than learning about them here. But that's the way it is. Let me show you vertical and horizontal asymptotes working together. Okay, I'm going to make a Y axis. And I'm going to make an X axis. Okay, now I'm going to just make up, okay? I'm going to just make up a vertical asymptote. How about right here? Yeah. One of the great things with the update is that now I can make a dashed line. I mean, it's automatic. I can make it automatic. That makes life a lot easier for me. Okay, and I'm going to make a horizontal asymptote so you'll be able to see the value. So let's make that blue. Um, yeah, see, isn't that cool? I love it, love it, love it. Okay, and, and we need to make it a different color. So how about blue? Blue. Okay, let's see if that worked. You never know. Yes, it does. Okay, this is a horizontal asymptote. It's horizontal, sort of, not perfectly, but if I hadn't drawn it, it would have been perfectly horizontal. Horizontal asymptote. and vertical vertical asymptotes are absolute if your graph were to cross a vertical asymptote, I can promise you it would cause an explosion in a power plant. I mean, if that were an equation used in the power plant. I mean, if it were a formula used in the power plant. Um, it, things aren't that absolute with horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes do not indicate danger. They do indicate a tendency over time. And so what these do is they actually create a frame for your graph. For instance, now being that I'm the world's worst grapher, okay, the absolute worst. I'm going to try anyway. Never give up. It creates a frame for my graph so that if you were graphing, your life would be a lot easier. Because all you have to do is start out really close to the vertical asymptote. And most of the time, enter, I mean, end up really close to the horizontal asymptote. Most of the time, your graph is not going to cross the horizontal asymptote, but there is no rule that says it cannot because nothing bad is going to happen. The important thing about the horizontal asymptote 
is this is the tendency of whatever you're measuring. On the other hand, with vertical asymptotes, your graph is always going to shoot up to positive infinity on the y-axis or shoot down to negative infinity on the y-axis, but never actually cross the vertical asymptote. Just get very, very, very close to the point that you can't tell the difference. That's kind of taking it on faith there. So you have to have faith. Even to be a mathematician or a scientist, you have to have faith. Namely, that a vertical asymptote is not going to get crossed. Okay, now, here comes the hard and the easy stuff that we are going to talk about again tomorrow. But, but, annotations flatten, yes. That's because I'm about to add another page. Insert a page, I don't want it white, I want it to be notebook paper. Okay. There. Now I am going to go back to no, no, no. Yes, this is what I want. Okay, x minus seven over three minus x. Let's work with that one first. I'm not going to graph it or anything. I'm going to show you In fact, I'm going to go up there and show you. There it is. The horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote for this graph is located at, uh, we'll make it green, just to keep our colors different. No, I was making it blue, wasn't I? Let's keep it blue. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. And I'm gonna show you how I know this. But the horizontal asymptote for this graph is y equals negative one. Well, I guess I had green. Oh, well, okay. Here you go. That's the horizontal asymptote, which is called the ha. Ha, 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 ha. And the vertical asymptote, yes, is called the the va, va. So we have the va and the ha, and they form a very nice shell or frame for the graph you're graphing. But the question is, how did I know that the uh, aside from looking at the graph and guessing, how did I know for sure that the line y equals negative one is the horizontal asymptote? And this is how. You have to know your degrees, your degrees of terms. The degree of X is one. Well, I might as well write in green. Degree one. And of course, the degree of a constant is zero. Degree zero. Degree zero. The degree of a constant is zero.
and the degree of a, of a, uh, um, a linear term is one. And you know it's a linear term, you know its degree is one because there's an invisible one power that X is raised to. So, that makes that a leading term. So another way to write this, a better way to write it, is X minus seven over negative X plus three. So that our leading terms are in front where they should be. And this is important for finding the horizontal asymptote. You take the leading terms and you compare them. To find the horizontal asymptote, see it really is a lot more trouble than the vertical asymptote. To find the horizontal asymptote, Compare the leading terms. Okay, we're going to do that. The leading terms are X and negative X, which means one X and negative one X. This leading term is degree one. And this leading term is degree one. So we compare the degrees. Compare degrees of leading terms. All right, here's the first rule. The first official rule for horizontal asymptotes. One, if the degrees of the leading terms, I'm going to say of the LCs, are equal then the ha of oh, then the ha is Now, how to say this? Y equals. No, 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 leading term. It's not leading coefficient, it's leading term. So compare the degrees of the LTs. So I do have to erase that. It's not LCs, it's LTs. Compare the degrees of the leading terms. Why do I care? Because I'm about to compare the leading coefficients when the degrees are equal. 
OK, so if the degrees of the leading terms are equal, then the ha is, I should say the equation of the ha is, the leading coefficient on top, let's see, how do you say, I'm just going to say on top, to heck with it, in the numerator, over the leading coefficient on the bottom, in the denominator, on bottom. See, I, bottom. Now, what does that mean for us? It means that the ha, or no, the equation of the ha is y equals one over negative one, which is negative one. Now, going way back, way back to what feels like the beginning of the century. That's how I knew that the, the horizontal asymptote was y equals negative one. Because I can look at this and I said to myself, hmm, degree one and degree one. So all I have to do is take the leading coefficients and put them into a ratio. The top leading coefficient over the bottom leading coefficient which will be one over negative one, which is negative one. And that's your first rule. Now it so happens that here, Let's do this. The other one is easier. And the third one is easiest yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Rule two. So two. If the degree of the numerator the top is lower than the degree of the denominator The ha is the x axis. How about that? The x axis has the equation y equals zero. So here the equation of the top, the numerator, is degree zero because constants are always degree zero. 
The degree of the bottom is the degree of the leading term on the bottom, and that's three. So the degree down here is three. The degree of the top is lower than the degree of the bottom. The degree of the numerator is lower than the degree of the denominator. So the ha is y equals zero, which is the x-axis. Let's go take a look at the graph. Well, here that's going to be true. See how the graph gets closer and closer to the x-axis. And here, uh-huh, see how the graph gets closer and closer to the x-axis. In there is not that important, but out here on the edges, that's what we care about. And here, the graph gets closer and closer to the x-axis. Notice it's not close there, that's okay. But out here and out here, it's almost touching the x-axis. The graph is almost touching the x-axis. And the third rule, this is really easy. We can still use the, the example in number two. No, we can't. But suppose I had a different example. Suppose I had, let's call it g of x. Equals 2x to the third minus 20x squared plus 32x over 7. How about that? Or even over 7x. Let's do that. Okay, the degree of the top is three. The degree of the numerator is three. The degree of the denominator, now that I put the x down there, is one. If the degree of the numerator, the top, See, we're getting the boring stuff out of the way today. If the degree of the numerator is higher than, bigger than, The degree of the denominator, like here, There is no horizontal asymptote. You'll have an oblique asymptote, but you don't have to know what it is. Because I hope you won't end up with any of those problems. So you won't have to say what it is. OK, so yes, yes, there will be no ha, no, no laughter, no ha. There will be no ha alas and alack okay that's it we'll go back over these rules tomorrow
we have an assignment with horizontal asymptotes. And then, and then we are going to analyze, analyze rational functions. We're going to, on top of finding the asymptotes, we're going to find the x-axis, uh, the x-axis, the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. So it's going to be an exciting day. Maybe even more exciting than today. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.